For some of you, that lasts way too long. For some of you, it's just not long enough. I get that. So, uh, so somewhere in the middle is an important spot there. Uh, so happy that you're here this morning. Thanks for joining us online. For those that are joining online, my name is Chris, and uh, today is indeed Palm Sunday. And we have been walking through a series in Romans for a number of weeks since I, th- I believe it was the second Sunday in February is when we began. And we're going to continue on through much of this year. And the, the subtitle to this series is From Death to Life. And really, this week is defined by life, and then it's death, and then life again. It is this week of really um, thinking of putting yourself in that story, these, these ups and downs, this emotional roller coaster for Jesus' followers. And we, too, have this opportunity to engage in the story, engage in this moment, to really process and, and pray through and reflect on this week. Now, for some, what's going to happen is you're going to be here, and then you're going to show up on Sunday next week, and it's going to be like, Easter, woohoo! And we're going to skip right over the death part. But I encourage you, whether you're here this coming Friday for Good Friday service at 6 o'clock, um, or you on your own this week, you take time to reflect on this last week of Jesus. I can't encourage that enough, that we pause and we walk with Jesus. This week I sat with uh, first responders. Uh, There's a training I went to this week with first responders from the county. And one of the conversations that we entered into was uh, about death notifications and, and processing death. And not a topic we want to talk about. But as we talked it was one of the things that we as a culture, we just, we push aside, we try to dress up or we ignore the reality that death is part of life. And that as a follower of Jesus, death, the death of Jesus is essential to our faith. And we can skip right over it real quick and just be like, yeah, Jesus died for me, woo, I'm saved. And we move forward in celebration. But what if this week that we take that time to walk with Jesus, to pray and to consider what Jesus walked through. And as we do every week, we provide a daily reading in the weekly. And this week it walks through Jesus' steps and there's some reflection with it. And so I want to encourage you, whatever it is, that you take that time to walk with Jesus. So we'll be here at 6 o'clock on Friday if you're able to join us for a service that's a reflective, prayerful, scripture-filled service. And then next Sunday we'll celebrate here at 8.30 and 10.30. And you're already here in first service. What I'm going to do for next service is I'm going to encourage more of them to join you here uh, because there's a lot of green seats that are open. And I encourage you to invite someone, too. As, uh, I smiled at Chris when he said, you know, say hello to your neighbor. Um, your, your neighbor, like you know that in church language, is like the person next to you. Uh, but outside church language, um, your neighbor may be the person that physically lives next to you or near you or works near you. So who's that neighbor that you can invite to be a part of service here next week? So they're identical services, 8.30 and 10.30, and so we look forward to that. All right, so today we are, like I said, we're in the series in Romans, but we're pressing pause. We're kind of sidestepping the story of Jesus and his life and his death and his life again is essential and crucial to the narrative in Romans, the letter to Romans. But I want to look more specifically at Two different texts here that speak to Palm Sunday and to what is unfolding in this time. So if you want to turn to both Luke 9 and also Matthew 21, these are the two passages that we're going to be looking into today. And as you're turning there, we are going to talk very briefly about a very thrilling subject for some of you in this room of mathematics. Mike is all about it. That's, I get one positive response in this room. I am like scanning the room. Others of you are like, oh, mathematics. Here we go. So specifically within mathematics, game theory. Now, game theory, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is defined as this. And I'm not going to pretend that I have this like in any level of understanding. But game theory is a branch of mathematics concerned with the analysis of strategies for dealing with competitive situations where the outcome of a participant's choice of action depends critically on the actions of other participants. And you're like, what in the world is he doing today, right? So this is analyzing 
strategy, interaction of a lot of different people in game theory. Now, game theory has been applied to war and business and politics and biology, just to name a few. And if you read the book or saw the 2001 film, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe, he played John Nash, who was a, uh, you were exposed a little bit to game theory in what John Nash uh, studied and unfolded. But for our time today, there's a, a side path off of game theory that philosopher James Carse looked into. And he said there's two types of games when it comes to game theory. He said there is the finite and the infinite. There's two different types of game theory. And he unpacked this in his book that he wrote. So there's the finite game, which is the here and now, and then the infinite, which is eternal. So he broke it out like this. is finite is there is a definite beginning and ending. The goal of a finite game is to win, and there is a winner that is declared. For an infinite game, there is not a knowable beginning or end, The goal is to continue to play, and growth is the outcome. So two radical things, this finite reality and this infinite reality that he talked about when it comes to this game theory, how people interact and what their goals are. Now, if we were to use video games as an example, you think back to the 80s and 90s, games like Pong or Tetris or Mario, is that your goal was to begin, and then you would get so far and either Mario would get wiped out, or your little Tetris block wouldn't fit, or that Pong ball thing would fall into the abyss, whatever it is, and it would end, and then you start over. And you just keep trying to progress, but you always go back, always go back, always go back. Whereas games over the last really 20 years have been more open world, more online gaming. Not just about starting and then getting as far as you can and then starting over, but rather building characters and building worlds, building this out, to really there is no end to this reality. James Carsey identifies numerous examples of finite game situations where your, your goal is to win, to be the best. Sports, debates, education. Whereas he says an infinite game is, is really only one true example. There's other things you can go to, but there's one true example, and that's life. Life is this infinite game. And your goal in life is to move forward, to grow, to mature. I mean, if some of you are sitting here, you know, with a pacifier and a bib on, and, you know, it would be like, it's time to grow up, right? And the Bible speaks to this maturing as well, that we need to mature, we need to grow, we need to move forward, not only for life here and now, but life eternal. However, we as humans, we're tempted to go back and play this finite game where the goal is to win, and we want to be the winner. We want to be around winners. How do we align? How do we win? How are we part of that? See, it's about, yes, our beliefs, but it's also about our actions. So how do we live? How do we unfold? How do we think about life? Is it in the finite or is it in the infinite? Now, You won't find the phrase game theory in Scripture. You won't find James Carse's philosophy in Scripture. But Jesus takes this same concept head on on Palm Sunday. So let's look at Luke 9, starting in verse 43. It says this, And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples. Now, before we get to what he said, I want you to think about this scene. There's Jesus. He has been healing people. Crowds are gathering. His fame is rising. People are like, hey, Jesus is in town. Have you met Jesus? Have you been around Jesus? Did you see what Jesus did? Jesus' fame is growing. And in this scene, he had just healed a demon-possessed child. And Jesus appears to, quote, unquote, be winning. And everyone's celebrating Jesus. And people want to be around Jesus. And we as human beings, we want to be around people who are, quote, unquote, winning. In your lifetime, you have aligned yourself with people with influence or money or fame or whatever it may be. Whether you consciously think of it, you are drawn this direction. 
That doesn't mean everyone. But you want to be around people who are quote-unquote winning. This is no different when people saw Jesus. We admire people who are successful. Years ago, I shared about a time where Joanna and I went to Nashville to go to an event that uh, a friend of ours was holding. And there was about 40 people that were invited to this home, and I was thrilled to go because this was at the home of a Christian musician that I had listened to ever since I was a child. And I was just this, like, nervous kid going up there, I'm, like, going up to the house and going in, and I tried really, really hard not to, like, just go up and just take selfies with people and, you know, like, keep my hands off the Grammys and gold records that were there. And I, that night, as, as silly as it even sounds for me to say now, like, I felt good about myself. I felt important to be there. Nothing I had done had earned that position. But I was part of something that felt bigger than myself, something being around people with larger platforms. And I wonder if those in Jesus' crowds felt that same way or maybe that way when you've been around someone with success or influence or power or fame. Back to Luke, it says, They were all amazed at the greatness of God, and while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. So essentially, Jesus is saying, I'm giving up my power. I'm giving up my influence. These crowds are not going to be around. Verse 45 says this, they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. So the disciples, in their immense wisdom, which I, I just love the disciples because I can relate to them so many times again and again of how they just fell flat on their face, right? Is in their immense wisdom, they ignore Jesus, and then they do what in verse 46? They start arguing with one another. An argument starts among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus just says, hey, I'm giving up my power. I'm giving up my influence. And the disciples are like, I want to be the greatest. It's me. Jesus, in verse 47, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least among you all who is the greatest. So there's the disciples. They're speaking of greatness. They're thinking in the finite, the here and now. They're thinking influence and power and prestige now. And Jesus is saying, hey, look at this little child. Humility is what it's about. There's greatness not in the now but in the infinite. Verse 49, Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. Now, the disciples, again, ignore Jesus' comment, his illustration of a child, and they're like, hey, let's talk about this problem. Yeah, good illustration, but let's talk about this problem. There's someone claiming to drive out demons in your name. And Jesus said this, don't stop him. Do not stop him. For whoever is not against you is for you. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. The disciples did not understand. They thought Jesus was coming in the here and now to save them. They probably thought everyone is going to respond really well to Jesus. Everyone's going to welcome him with open arms. Verse 53 says this, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And the disciples are thinking, this is Jesus. He's important. He's doing something great. There's crowds that cheer him. Verse 54, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, that they weren't welcomed, they asked, which is probably like, not the best solution, what they suggest here, is they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? I love the boldness, right? 
like, hey, they're not welcoming you. Let's just call God just to, just to, just to destroy him right here and now. Then everyone will really follow you. They'll be really impressed with you. There's this tension that was developing, right? Jesus was feeling this tension. It said he went resolutely to Jerusalem knowing what was coming. Think of his prayer that he's going to pray later this week. You can take this cup from me. His heart was to not go to the cross. But then he said, but not my will, but yours. The disciples are trying to figure out how to gain power in this moment. There's this tension between this finite earthly power and this infinite kingdom-focused reality. Flip over to Matthew chapter 21. The passage that we read in this day is set in the most sacred week of the year. It's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It's Passover. And these events unfold around the city of Jerusalem. And whereas Jerusalem at this time had about 40,000 people in it, it would multiply up to six times to almost a quarter million people during this week. So the city was full of great excitement and busyness, and people were thankful to be together. They were a part of something, again, larger than themselves. But there was also the tension that was mentioned. People were on edge. Why? Well, if we rewind our story about a thousand years previous, Jerusalem had become the capital city of ancient Israel in the time of King David. And David and his son Solomon experienced what was considered the greatest period of history for Israel. The country was united. The 12 tribes were under one king. They were large, powerful, safe. And David's reign <clears throat> was associated with power and glory and greatness and justice and righteousness. David was considered a shepherd king. He was revered and respected. So much so that the coming Messiah was called the son of David. After David's death, things radically changed in Jerusalem. A system of domination replaced justice and righteousness. The people of Israel ex experienced political oppression, economic exploitation, and religious abuse. And over the next 400 years, Jerusalem would be the center of injustice and betrayal of God's covenant. God's justice had been replaced by human injustice. And the prophets wrote during this time, and we have record of their insight. Here are just three of the prophets. Micah, who wrote in about 700 BC, said this. Then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. Some violence going on. Isaiah in the 600s said this. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She was once full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. And about 100 years later, Jeremiah writes, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, look around and consider, search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. So you see this, this downfall that's occurring. And then in 586, Jerusalem is conquered by the Babylonians. The city and the temple are destroyed, and the survivors are taken to Babylon as slaves. Fifty years later, the Jewish people are allowed to return to Jerusalem, but it was not the same. And for 600 years, Jewish people spoke of, they told stories, they prayed for, they hoped, they longed for new life. They longed for a restored kingdom of God in Jerusalem. They prayed for a son of David, the Messiah, to rule. And that brings us to Matthew 21. Verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, 
with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Remember, Jesus is entering Jerusalem during the the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we can't miss why they're celebrating this feast. This feast, Passover, is a festival remembering the liberation from Egypt. This is important to remember because at this time, the Jews were now under the occupation of the Romans, a new form of captivity. Like the Egyptians long ago, Romans were repressive and brutal. And Passover was not just a religious experience or or observance. It was also an expression for political freedom. There were riots. There were uprisings that were common. And there were many calls for revolution against the powers of oppression and systems and institutions. Because of this, Rome knew this would happen and was happening, so they would bring in more troops. And Rome did not hesitate to shed blood to remind them of who was great. Imperial Rome, they ruled with an iron fist. And they wanted to remind people of their power. Maybe you've seen movies or shows where the, the Roman army enters into a scene. But picture this. Is, picture cavalry of horses, foot soldiers marching, this leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners. Golden eagles mounted on poles. Sun reflecting off the metal and the gold. Marching feet. Feel that boom. Creaking leather, clinking bridles, beating drums, swirling dust. This was a demonstration of earthly power. And if anyone was honest, it was finite. And they knew it, but they embraced it. The emperor was not simply just the ruler of Rome, but was referred to as the Son of God. The emperor was referred to as Lord, as Savior, as the one who brought peace. So if we have this picture in mind, I want us to picture maybe another part of the city. Verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. So verse 7 Jesus is fulfilling a 500-year-old prophecy found in Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. So the people cheering Jesus as Jesus rides into the city, they're laying branches. They know this passage from Zechariah, and the crowds are starting to recognize this. The king has come. He's riding a donkey. And then he talk about chariots in Zechariah. Who has chariots? Who has war horses? Rome. Jesus here is the one who will be triumphant, victorious, command peace, dominion from sea to sea, as the disciples thought. So Matthew 21, verse 7 again. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they placed their cloaks for them on Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And as Nick mentioned earlier, Hosanna means save us. But it wasn't just save us from our sins. Because their mind was not on the infinite, it was on the finite. It was on... Rome being overthrown, because Hosanna was a slogan of the ultra-nationalistic zealots. When they said Hosanna, they were saying, save us, give us freedom, we're sick of the Romans, save us from Rome. And the palm branch wasn't just something cute that kids wave on Palm Sunday. 
It was a sign, not of peace and love and praise, but again, a political statement. It's like taking your country's flag and waving it in the face of an enemy. It's a pretty powerful statement. It's an act of defiance. What about the cloaks? In the Old Testament, 2 Kings 9.13, when Jehu was anointed king over Israel, it says this, they, the crowds, quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. They blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So these crowds, as Jesus entered, was proclaiming him as the true life-giving king in the face of the powers that were. Yet, the disciples, those on Palm Sunday, did not understand what Jesus was doing. They wanted rule in Jerusalem, the finite. They wanted Jesus to save them from earthly oppression, to rule here, to be the political power, to have the power here, to win the game now. Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a visual sign of the entrance of the infinite kingdom, the kingdom of God. The kingdom that will come where his will will be done, not only in heaven, but on earth. That it would be not only in Jerusalem, but it would be in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And Jesus came to give infinite life that no one else could give. Paul, in the letter to Rome, he said this. He said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. It's the power of God to bring salvation for everyone who believes. It's activated by faith. The righteous will live by faith. It's how we're known here and now. Consider the life that is talked about in Philippians 2, where Paul said, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God, this ultimate power, something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself of all earthly power. And he took on the very nature of an emperor, a dictator, a ruler. No, none of those things. Rather, a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Remember back in Luke 9, the disciples are arguing about greatness, about power, about being in the middle, about being around influential people and making the decisions. Jesus says, hey, remember this child? It's humility. Paul said Jesus made himself nothing. He was a servant. He humbled himself. He was obedient to the will and the work of God. And Paul calls us to the same mindset, this infinite life. This infinite life marked by Jesus in humility where we consider others better than ourselves. We put others first. We think of their needs first, not mine. We reject our own needs. We think of the other. We serve. We give our lives away to care for one another, never taking advantage of another person. We forgive even the people that we do not want to forgive. We love our enemy. We see them in the image of God. We look upon them with, and praying for a healing heart, both ours and theirs. See, this life that Jesus has and gives, he makes sure that everyone has daily bread, their needs are met. It seeks to forgive debts and sins. It avoids temptation to commit evil against our neighbors. It calls us to a life of forgiveness. Jesus came with this message. He, he said this. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, 
with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of who we are, we love God. This is the first and greatest commandment. And too often we stop right here. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang in these two commandments. Everything that is written in the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Do we love God? Do we love others? It is that simple and that difficult all at the same time. And Paul picked up this message of Jesus when he said, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This is a picture of the infinite life that Jesus offers to us. And we have an opportunity to live into. The finite life is defined by what was in Rome and what the disciples thought was important and when we put ourselves at the center of our world. It's the finite. What about the infinite? The life we're living, are we, are we making decisions and taking steps for the here and now only? Or is it an investment that impacts not only now, but the eternal? Jesus came to give us life and as his followers, we're to do the same. We're to respond to his love and love others. So what does this look like? First, it's a step of faith, a step of belief, which we have been talking about for weeks on end now. And belief is not just an intellectual exercise. Belief is an action. So do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Not just intellectually, Not just that God exists, that Jesus existed. The scripture tells us that the demons believe that. I mean, if we just believe that there's a God, we're on the same level as, as demons. I think there's more to it than following Jesus. It's more than an intellectual exercise. Have you surrendered your life? Have you laid your sin before him knowing there's nothing you can do about it, but that he can. Is he Lord of your life? The first thing is, do you know Jesus is your Savior, but is he Lord of your life? Does he direct your life, your words, your actions, your thoughts? When sin enters, do you reject it and flee? John 10 tells, John 10 tells us, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. We've all witnessed this. For too long, too many of us have allowed the thief to steal, kill, and destroy us. We've sinned in our words and our actions that have resulted in broken relationships. We have desired intimacy. Al, you talked about intimacy this morning. We've desired intimacy, but we've looked for it in sexual sin, porn, sex outside of marriage, thoughts, words, actions. We've desired financial security, but we have made poor financial decisions. Okay, I'll just fix this real quick with this debt, with this loan, with this whatever it is, just to, just to get through, and then it's this cycle. We have tried to make ourselves feel better with our words, so we've gossiped, we spoke evil of others. We've desired security in relationships, and we thought maybe if we'll just say this or do this, then I won't feel jealous or hurt or maybe I'll feel connected to this person. Only that we're destroying ourselves and destroying others. Or maybe sin has resulted in whatever, you fill in the blank. See, the good news is that that does not have to be life. That Jesus entered into that city for all who are looking for that temporary whatever, and only leaning into sin, anything less than Jesus. Jesus came that we may have life and life to the full. 
I like to quote that, right? The thief comes, kills, steal, and destroy. Jesus, come that we may have life and life to the full. But here's what he says in the next verse that we often leave off. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one to follow after. I'm the one to lean on. When you're in danger, when you're in trouble, when, when you are alone, call on me. I'm the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for you. It's who I am. That's what Jesus is saying. It's who I am. Let's pray. Jesus, you rode into that city but I can't imagine the thoughts and emotions that you were processing knowing that you were going to the cross, knowing the complex tension of the city you entered in, the fickle reality of those who cheered you and then would condemn, those that wanted to embrace power that were closest to you. Lord, you were coming to lay your life down. And so, Jesus, you know being a human is a complex reality. There's so much wrapped into it. There's our past experiences. There's our current realities. There's maybe fear or hope in the future. There's so much that's there. But you are the good shepherd who guides us, who calls us to yourself, who welcomes us, who reminds us of what it means to have life and life to the full. So Lord, for that person that has never surrendered their life to you, that have never confessed their sin, have never trusted you as their savior, just in these moments, in your own words, that you would tell Jesus that you trust him, that you believe, you would confess your sin. That you would receive his forgiveness. And for those of us who have maybe confessed you as our Savior, once again, we're reminded of the importance of your Lordship. Lord, in this moment, for each one of us, any sort of sin, no matter how we see it or justify it or explain it away, any sort of power grab or anything that's less of you, but just in the stillness of the moment, for each one of us, that we would confess that sin and we would receive your forgiveness. Jesus, you have heard these prayers. You know hearts and you know minds. Jesus, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for new life. And Jesus, I pray that we would walk with you this week as we journey to the cross and then ultimately to the empty tomb. And so, Jesus, we love you. God, we surrender this moment, this day to you, this week to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So there's definitely a heaviness, right, as we... We contemplate this, and here's the thing about this week is we seek to identify with Jesus as he goes to the cross, ultimately taking your sin, my sin. And so this week as we walk with him, maybe there's something that was stirred, maybe there's something that you pushed back against that I said that you didn't like, that's okay. It happens every week, multiple times, all right? That's okay, but I ask you to ask why. Like wrestle with that with the Lord. Wrestle with it in scripture. If the Spirit of God is poking you on something and you're rejecting it, why are you rejecting it? Why are you holding on to it? Let the Lord this week move in you and through you. Let his Spirit change you so that when we get to next Sunday, it is a day of freedom and celebration and resurrection. So I encourage you, do the hard work. I'm doing the hard work this week as well. So love you all, and Nick's gonna come up and close us.